I want to welcome all of you and to the audience that is streaming in to this um, and know that you can watch this later if you miss something or really have to see it again um, on our YouTube channel, as we have done with the other uh, events, symposia that we've had. Before I announce tonight's event and tell you a little bit about it, I want to give you some CASPIS news. Um, we have a project in mind to expand CASPIS slightly and to create some fabulous collaborative space, preserving it as it's been historically, but also bringing it into the 21st century in terms of high tech and places where people can really meet. And that required us to raise $5 million by May 1st and then the additional money over the next year. And we did it. <laughs> so this is a, I'm, I'm really excited. <laughs> so I, it, will con, it will be seen in various ways throughout the evening. Okay, this is the third uh, symposium of the year uh, in a series that's been focused on the relations among humans, technology, AI. And each of the symposia has involved our fellows and uh, faculty fellows, or so our, our resident fellows who are here for the year, and those um, who are part of this larger community of CASPIS. And each of them has focused on a different set of issues around technology. This one, as I hope you know, is focused on politics and government and how technology affects both of those. And we have two remarkable people who are fellows this year who will be giving short presentations. And then we will have a moderated discussion, which will include me. Um, and then we will open it up for questions from the rest of you. Um, so the first, the second speaker, but the first person I will introduce alphabetically is Carrie Chihak, who is uh, the chief of policy for the highest elected official in King County, Washington, which is the larger Seattle area. It's the metropolitan area of Seattle. And it's, it's where I live during the weekends and where I vote, and I can tell you for sure that it is one of the most exciting and innovative uh, governments in the country, and that's in no small part due to Carrie's work. She has a wonderful uh, county executive in Dal Constantine, who she works for, but she's been a real force behind a lot of the innovations and the thinking. and the evaluation of what's going on. And one of the things she's been doing here as a CASPIS fellow and will continue to do even after she leaves CASPIS is to um, help us create an impact evaluation design lab as part of our evidence-informed policy initiative. She does that as part of a team of people, another of whom is a fellow here this year, Graham Gottlieb, and the third leader in that core group is Jake Bowers, who will be a fellow here next year. So you can sort of see how these things work. And they've been working very closely with two governments as they begin to explore how to make this kind of project, which is really based on how to do some very different ways of evaluating policy so that we put into place and sustain and evaluate as we go along uh, policies that actually work and serve the purposes they're meant to serve or serve better purposes as you learn things and deal with unintended consequences. So they're dealing with, they have projects right now in King County um, as well as in Stockton, California. And as I said, this is a demonstration project. It's one of the first of its kind ever. It is the first of its kind ever. Um, but very linked to a lot of other projects that are going on in this space. And it's been very exciting to host it here. The other speaker is Nate Persley, who's at the law school. Um, he's the James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford, but we've luckily had him up here this year. And he regularly asks us for permission to depart for a while so that he can do work that is under one of his many hats which is to um, to rewrite districts, <laughs> to redraw districts, uh, the state legislative districts in North Carolina and most recently the congressional districts in Pennsylvania, which she has gotten some press about. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's nonpartisan, <laughs> at least on this. Um, Okay, but the other thing that he really thinks hard about and is uh, very engaged with is thinking about the effects of the web, the internet, uh, bots, all of that whole bunch of stuff um, on democracy and how it influences our voting, our thinking, our actions, our information and disinformation. Um, if you haven't read his 2017 article in the Journal of Democracy, Can Democracy Survive the Internet? I recommend that you do. And again, in this second hat, he's also gotten some press recently because he, with board member Gary King, CASPA's board member Gary King, who's also a Harvard professor, um, are the leaders of an initiative which is getting access to Facebook data um, to analyze it, to understand better the ways in which democracy is actually influenced by the way in which the internet and particularly social media in the form of Facebook is organized. And that's a big project that is being administered by the Social Science Research Council and is being funded by an extraordinary consortium of funders that include um, the Hewlett Foundation and the Knight Foundation, but also the Koch Foundation just to give you a sense of the, the range. And many others are now signing on to it. So I'm gonna, we're gonna start with Nate, who promises me he's gonna give a version of the talk I've heard five or six times. <laughs> but I'm so excited about the Casbis building that I'll stay wide awake. <laughs> no, it's a great talk. And then Carrie will follow. Each will speak for about 10 or 15 minutes, and we'll have 15 or 20 minutes of discussion followed by question and answer. Great. Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Margaret, uh, for this year. It is, I mean, as I'm sure is the case with most fellows, toward the end, you're going to have to pry this from my cold, dead hands, my, my, <laughs> my, my study, right? It's been a wonderful year, and um, thank you to all the fellows who, are, who have come here today. So as Margaret said, I, uh, I'm a law of democracy person. So that's, that's the class I teach down at Stanford and, and the area of my research, whether it's voting rights or uh, campaign finance, redistricting, political parties and the like. And so my entree into this topic of the influence of the internet on democracy originally came from two strands of research that I've been doing. One on political polarization as sort of a political scientist uh, I often say that you can tell, I'm a political scientist as well as a law professor, as well as, a, as Margaret mentioned, and somebody who works in this area, I often say you can tell when I'm a political scientist because I have data without opinions. You can tell when I'm a law professor because I have opinions without data. Uh, and you can tell when I'm a lawyer because, well, it depends what my client says. So, so um, I think you've heard that three times as well. <laughs> but I always uh, laugh. Uh, but, but, you know, 70% of you haven't. So... Um, my entree into this topic of the influence of the internet on democracy was both from the polarization research and also campaign finance. Uh, when the much maligned Supreme Court decision in Citizens United versus FEC came down, most people looked at it and criticized it as uh, giving corporations First Amendment rights or treating corporations like people. I saw that case more as uh, an example or, a, or a, a sort of touchstone for how the changing telecommunications environment uh, would dovetail with the First Amendment. Because that case, which we mostly think of as about corporate advertising, was actually about an on-demand movie that a nonprofit corporation put up on on-demand programming that you could download. And in the case and in the discussion uh, surrounding it, there was all this question about whether the way we've thought about regulation of politics, particularly political money, uh, has been predicated on television and linear programming as being the main way that politicians and groups communicate with voters. And uh, if you sort of look at the case and, and, and the atmospherics around it, that is in some ways the most significant aspect of the case, is trying to figure out um, how this architecture of uh, communications regulation that was... That was um, set in place for the television era, could be adapted uh, to the internet age. Um, 
if you look at this sort of studying of democracy and the internet over the last 20 years, right, we've moved from sort of utopianism to dystopianism, right, uh, with the 2016 election as being the kind of breaking point. Um, and uh, so this article that Margaret referenced um, was my attempt to move from what was um, the sort of literature on th thinking about the, the internet as an em empowerment uh, tool for small voices that uh, had been excluded by the media intermediaries to the now dark side of the internet, which is things like hate speech and bots and fake news and the like. So let me just give you uh, the, the now six minute version of, of this longer talk that I often give. And that is about what is the problem when we talk about whether democracy can survive the internet, what is uh, the, sort of the unique problem that the internet poses for democracy. And so the sort of overarching concern, I think, is that to the, to the extent that we, particularly in the United States, have thought that the marketplace of ideas, right, the unregulated marketplace of ideas is the best test for truth, it's not clear that that's ever been true, but it's not true in the internet age, okay? So that if we thought that truth will win out through the comp more voices sort of battling it out um, on the internet, uh, there the empirics just don't seem to be there. There are other consequences to that, and that is that to the extent we've thought that democracy is about a conversation among nationals in that political system who are human, how do you reconcile that with the internet age in which anyone from around the world can basically be part of the political and electoral conversation of a country to the point where the, the country is almost, the government's really unable to regulate it except through draconian means. Uh, and the fact that it's not limited to humans, right? That bots or uh, what we call computational propaganda can play an important role in uh, that conversation as well. Okay? And so those are sort of the overarching uh, questions. But I think it's important not to think about these questions um, along the lines that we often talk about them. So fake news, as, as difficult a, a, a moniker as that gen generally is, is not the problem, okay? Uh, and that is, it is not a problem that is unique to the internet age, right? Fake news is as old as news. Hate speech is as old as speech. Uh, and so the question that I, I try to answer is, well, what is it about the new technology? What is it about the internet that poses unique threats to democracy? And so let me just set forth what, what those are. Um, the first is sort of a family of problems, which we can call velocity, virality, and volume, okay? The speed at which information travels, the fact that it is not uh, mediated by elites, but it's done through viral transfer, and then the sheer amount of communication that's out there, which requires some kind of curation uh, by platforms and others, right? There's a sort of, if you look on the web, you know, you can find uh, Mark Twain as having said in 1917 that, you know, the, the, um, a lie makes its way halfway around the world before the truth puts its boots on, right? <laughs> Turns out Mark Twain was dead by 1917, so this is another example of where the internet gets it wrong, but the, the, the point still holds, right? And, um, uh, you know, in, in thinking about whether the marketplace of ideas can regulate that phenomenon, when you had, uh, there's always been a problem with rumors, there's, and, and, and we should not pretend that all of these problems are, are new to the internet, but the speed at which information travels is just a difference in kind, uh, if not significantly in degree. Um, the viral transfer of information, right, and communication is obviously one of the defining features of the internet age, uh, because to the extent we relied on intermediaries like Walter Cronkite to tell us at the end of the evening news, that's just the way it is, right? No one has the credibility to do that anymore, right? So you do not have trusted intermediaries that have a national audience and that can filter what are the sort of permissible bounds of political conversation. Now, let's be clear, right? Those intermediaries, those elites, um, curbed discussion of all kinds of contentious issues and, and uh, you know, um, uh, excluded voices that should have been heard, whether it's racial minorities or uh, political minorities or um, ideological groups. Nevertheless, uh, while excluding those on the far left and the, on the far right, uh, it did have some kind of fil filtering mechanism for what was uh, permissible discourse. In addition to those problems of velocity, virality, and volume, you also have um, the problem of anonymity. And so while 
anonymity is, again, not new to the internet, and it is even constitutionally protected. Let's not forget that the, uh, you know, Publius the, wrote the Federalist Papers, right? So, you know, Hamilton, uh, uh, Madison, and Jay, you've seen the play, right? So, uh, 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 wrote, right wrote under a pseudonym uh, for various reasons. And, there, and even under the First Amendment, uh, anonymous speech is often uh, protected. But with anonymous speech, with the protection that the internet gives anonymous speakers, you have both the hate speech problem and the bot problem. Because the bot problem, right, the ability of computers essentially to impersonate uh, individual speakers is a function of the fact that on the internet you cannot see the person that you are talking to. Right Now, bots have all kinds of other problems. They manipulate search engines. They artificially uh, seem to suggest support for political leaders, including our president, who's retweeted brought bots 150 times. Um, and that's not an exaggeration. He has retweeted bots over 150 times. Um, uh, but, but, uh, but the problem with bots uh, and anonymity is the same, and, and I'm sorry, and hate speech is the same, which is the, our inability to figure out who the speaker is behind the speech, right? Um, there is actually an interesting sort of line of research right now as to whether um, sort of hate speech has been going up online right, whether our online lives are uh, more uncivil. Um, if you look at Twitter, it's not clear that over the last two years, like the share of speech, which is hate speech, has actually been going up. Nevertheless, through the internet, whether it's on Reddit or 4chan or all these other kind of sort of cauldrons of hate that, that, that have dark corners on, on the internet, um, you, you can do something on the internet that you couldn't do in the real world, which is to find like-minded people um, to, uh, that, that share an extreme point of view. Um, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, for beneficent reasons, you know, the, of people who want to mobilize against the government, say, in far-off places, or, as we've seen here, you know, to, to share conspiracy theories about what's happening in a pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C., <laughs> so beyond that, um, there's also the problem of what we, in the uh, social scientists who look at this, the problem of homophily or echo chambers, right? That um, Cass Sunstein, the, the, has been, uh, my Harvard colleague, has been uh, the progenitor of this uh, in three different books on the exact same topic. Uh, and, and, and wait, this is being taped, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> which I recommend to all of you. Um, uh, and... and uh, but the, the, the argument, the, the point is that um, the internet allows us to self-select self into our own filter bubbles, information cocoons, um, and, and the like, and that it allows for self-reinforcement, which is an engine of polarization. Now, one of the problems uh, here is that, again, it's not clear that our online lives are actually more homophilous or homogeneous uh, than our offline lives, because we tend to live in pretty politically homogeneous neighborhoods. But for the same reason I was talking about hate speech before, you can find a homogenous community on the internet uh, that shares your political beliefs much uh, more easily than you can uh, in the real world. Um, so if you want, you know, if you're interested in particular types of cat videos, right, there's an internet website for you. Um, the last two problems, and then I'll, I'll stop, are first, this problem of sovereignty. Right, which is the ability of a government to control the electoral and political conversation uh, to its own nationals or citizens. And so we have thought of whether it's the FCC or the FEC or some government uh, body in the US and, and their analogs elsewhere as having a role to secure the democracy and to set rules for permissible uh, political activity. In the internet age, with the web, which is worldwide after all, um, it is extremely difficult for a government to do that. You know, case in point, of course, is the whole Russia investigation that we're undergoing right now. But what we've, if you talk to folks in other countries, it's like, you know, the U.S. is late to the party here. This has been happening all over the world. Uh, and if you talk to intelligence officials or, or others, it's only accelerating. And then new actors are taking cues from what happened in the 2016 election. And, you know, this is just a, a, a 
again, a unique feature of the internet. There's, there's an exi- there are, of course, examples of where the U.S. has tried to influence elections around the world prior to you know, the modern internet era. But um, when you can't tell the difference between you know, a Russian troll or cyborg or, or, or bot and a domestic speaker, it becomes increasingly difficult uh, for the government to control the electoral universe in the way it had previously. The final problem is the problem of monopoly. And that is the role that particularly Facebook and Google play in, um, in structuring the political conversation and the way that information travels in this new ecosystem. I'll have a lot to, to say about that. Maybe we'll talk more about that in the, in the questions. But these platforms are, are characteristically different than CBS, NBC, uh, uh, and, and their predecessors, right? The rules that these platforms have for electoral and political conversation are more important in many ways than formal law that comes from government. And so the terms of service and community guidelines and what they're going to say is permissible uh, and, and what's going to violate their policies is absolutely Absolutely critical in determining uh, the political conversation in the run-up to elections. And even more importantly, the sort of hidden rules that feed the algorithm are absolutely essential in understanding what types of information get prioritized in someone's news feed or Twitter feed or search results. And so that kind of, those kind of decisions about how to prioritize some types of information over others really are the sort of critical ingredients to determining uh, influence in elections. Thank you, Nate. I forgot to announce that we actually have a co-sponsor of tonight. I shouldn't have left out our co-sponsor, which is the Cybersecurity Initiative, which both Nate and I are involved with um, in trying to establish some rules about some of these kinds of things that you were talking about. Carrie. Hi, everybody. Uh, I want to give a shout out to all of my uh, friends and colleagues back in King County who are, who are also tuning in. Um, and it's really great to be here pa- paired with Nate. Um, you can see the rich intellectual environment in which I've been steeped over the last a year. And so really want to thank the center and Margaret particularly for that. Um, I'm really going to talk about quite a different perspective, which is the perspective of regional and local governments in this new technology environment. And I want to introduce three topics that you might not have quite thought about before um, related to the impact of technology on a local government. And then I'm going to pose some questions in those, those areas that we as communities really need to address. So the three topics are digital equity, a government's regulatory role, uh, and at the local government level, and then the impact of the tech industry on our communities, particularly communities like the one I'm from, the Seattle region, and here in Silicon Valley. So around that first topic of digital equity, um, it's I thought it was a popular conception um, to view technology as the great equalizer, and I went on to a popular search engine uh, to check that out, and I ended up getting 8.7 million hits, so I think it's fair to say that that's a a common um, perception. But there's a big tension between the promise of tech as the great equalizer and the reality of tech as an accelerator. And tech as an accelerator is going to accelerate many, many things, including a thing that I'm very concerned about, which is widening inequities in our, in our communities. Increasingly, tech holds the key for each of us to fulfill our own potential and, in fact, even meet some of our most basic needs. Governments are using technology in new ways. Some of them are matters of convenience. Does anybody remember having to go down to the DMV to renew your driver's license? We can now do it online, which is a great convenience. But some of those um, ways that government is using tech are actually kind of life and death matters. Um, Tech was... um, you know, used a lot, you know, just north of here to get wildfire alerts out to people um, with, you know, some success and some not such great success. And of course, it's, you know, a a point of access for people around employment, housing, education, um, all of those things are increasingly dependent upon our access to technology. So tech is only going to become that great equalizer if we actually equalize access to tech. And in the United States and in many of our communities, we're not doing such a hot job of that, actually. 
So my home state of Washington um, is actually has the highest in-home broadband adoption rate in the country. California is not far behind. And 82% of households in Washington state have broadband internet access. That might sound really high, but of course, the flip side of that is obviously 18% or nearly one in five households do not have broadband uh, reliable ready access. And that 18% is not evenly distributed. Um, low income households, particularly households who earn less than uh, $50,000 a year, which are disproportionately households of, of color, they're five times more likely not to have broadband access at home. Now, I often hear people say, well, we don't really have to worry about that because, right, reach into your pocket, we all have the smartphone. And uh, it's actually not true. So for people who are earning 30, uh, under $30,000 uh, in the United States, over 30% of those people don't have a smartphone. Um, and those who do have a smartphone and uh, rely on their internet access through a smartphone, it's, it's not that easy, right? Think about trying to fill out a job application on a smartphone. Or think about your own child trying to do their homework on a smartphone. Um, and you know, the cost of data, the cost of devices is also a huge barrier to people. Um, so, so that digital inequity is something that we should all be really concerned about. Um, it's exacerbated in the United States by the fact that we typically pay more for internet access than people in Europe and uh, Asia do for speeds that are less. And we typically have um, very little choice in who our, our provider is. Um, we have an opportunity in the U.S. coming up in the next um, few years to boost speed, ease, affordability, access, and equity as we roll out 5G. That's going to make wireless very comparable to broadband speeds we have today. But it's going to really require us to take a planful approach, and that's probably going to have, have to happen um, community by community. So the second topic I wanted to hit on is um, uh, regards local government's regulatory role in this new tech environment. And I'm going to take a very different spin from what you've heard Nate talk about or what you've heard a lot of talk about with regard to um, privacy considerations and really, again, speak from the local government perspective. Um, the emergence of technology-based services is really providing a lot of challenges and questions around local government's role as a regulator. Um, through the platform economy, we can share stuff, we can get stuff delivered, and we can get stuff done for us. Um, there's ride share, home rentals, meal share, dockless bites and scooter share. We have food, alcohol, and marijuana delivery. I realize that for some of you, that's probably not a new feature. Um, we have moving, home repair, cleaning, and even massage services that are on demand and literally at the tips of our fingertips. And you know, if you think about it, many of these enterprises, they have very few employees, they have very little physical infrastructure, they can scale up very, very quickly. Um, other, other technologies like autonomous vehicles are gonna take longer time to come to scale, but they could completely really transform our lives and our, our, our living environments. And there's lots of really wonderful positive benefits we all derive um, from the platform economy, better social connection, sharing of resources, more control over, over the use of our time. But there's a tension between those positive benefits and the expectations we have regarding safety and fairness when we sort of enter into this public common space that tech is providing us. And we have to rethink the role of local government um, in, in regulating those public commons. So, you know, just take a minute to think about it. Like, it's kind of crazy that you are willing to get into a complete stranger's car and have them drive you around, or that you are willing to let strangers into, into your car. Um, we're willing to have people we have never met prepare food for us that we will eat. And the only reason we're really willing to undertake those kinds of activities is because we've built an expectation that it's safe, that there's some kind of system behind all of that activity that, um, that is looking out for us as consumers. And when we're in places like when we travel to places where we don't really feel that um, that system is there, we act in really, really different ways. And it does not take much for us, our confidence in those systems to be undermined. 
So, you know, heretofore, a lot of our um, expectations that allow those markets to work have been built on the backbone of a government regulatory structure. And the emergence of that platform economy and the pace of individual of innovation is really challenging that regulatory structure. So I'm going to pose some questions about local government's regulatory role in uh, four areas. The balance of risk and responsibility, ensuring a fair and non-discriminatory market, the benefits of cooperation, and active design of our, our physical environments of our communities. So with regard to the balance of risk and responsibility, who holds that in the platform economy? Is it the platform itself? Is it us as consumers? Is it workers? Or is it the government? Or is it some combination of these? Businesses in the platform economy often claim to just be matchmakers, that they're doing nothing more than providing the platform, and so they can't be subject to, to regulation. But what are our expectations as consumers or workers as to the responsibilities those platforms should hold and how government should regulate them to quality standards, um, treatment, rights of workers, or independent contractors, um, liability, and the like? And where do we draw that balance between our private assumption of risk and our expectation regarding the role of government in regulating these kinds of business activities? As consumers, it's, it's a little bit of a paradox for me. I see as consumers, we're demanding more and more information from government about restaurant uh, food safety, placarding. You see lots of, of, of placarding. Um, that's much more transparent going on. So how much more risk are we willing to assume ourselves when we dine in someone's home, you know, someone that we don't know, through a meal sharing app? And are expectations different if that person's providing 100 meals a week versus five meals a week? These are questions that we, we have to answer. Um, so the second uh, area underneath um, the regulatory role of government is around ensuring a fair and non-discriminatory market. And here there are really two issues. One is equal treatment of like business activity, and the second is equal access for consumers. Um, um, there's a tension in businesses' desire to create, for government to create these more flexible regulatory frameworks that allow for innovation, but business also wants total clarity about the rules and how they can, and how they can uh, um, meet, meet the regulatory expectations and, make, and they want to be assured that those rules are going to be applied equally to all players. And furthermore, we really need to think about how we are um, regulating similarly activities that are similar. So a food truck, a caterer, you know, there's a, there's a process by which you go through to get a public health license for those kinds of activities. And how is that much different from someone providing a meal out of their home through a meal sharing app? Those are very, very kind of like activities, and we need to think about how we change our regulatory structures to, um, to address these. And then another role of government regulation um, in the traditional business uh, community has been ensuring non-discrimination. Taxi companies, when they're licensed, typically have to agree to serve an entire community. Um, of course, you know, that doesn't always work out exactly the way we want it to, but um, we do have some principles and standards and enforcement mechanisms around, around that. Hotels can't discriminate against who wants to rent rooms from them. So how do we ensure these new business models also aren't, aren't discriminatory? A third area um, around uh, local government's role in regulating new technology is really the need for more cooperation. And that's both between businesses and government as well as uh, among governments. We typically tend to view businesses and governments as being in opposition around um, regulatory structures. And in fact, a lot of these new businesses appear to be um, taking the tactic of avoiding regulators um, and then begging, or in fact, even demanding forgiveness uh, uh, later. And, you know, that's often at the peril of the first runners in these industries. Um, they may end up having their operations set, shut down, incurring uh, legal fees, running out of working uh, capital before the regulatory frameworks can catch up. So how can we really foster um, a more um, open approaches between business and government that can benefit both the business environment and our public interest as well? And then governments are also struggling to keep up with the pace at which these new business models are emerging. 
And we could really benefit from governments um, cooperating more across boundaries. It doesn't make sense if you, you know, have a bike share in one small community here, but you can't take the bike into another community over here. So trying to find some common frameworks for um, regulation across jurisdictional boundaries, but also to share ideas and um, create more, more common frameworks for the business environment. And then the, the last issue I want to address with respect to government's regulatory role is um, the power of new technologies to really reshape uh, in a significant way the physical environment of our communities. And you know, this has been a big topic of uh, discussion up in San Francisco where scooter share was introduced and people are like freaking out about all of the scooters all over the place um, that literally appeared like overnight on the sidewalks. And so what do we want government's role to be in allowing or prohibiting business activity either in these kind of public spaces or in residential areas. Um, and a much more complex issue around this question is the purposeful design of our public spaces and communities and how we, how we design those in such a way to accommodate technology advances like assistive technologies, delivery robots are running around Palo Alto now, um, public Wi-Fi and autonomous vehicles. And, um, A.D. Tomer at the Brookings Institute recently um, wrote this really great article I recommend to you um, around local planning for autonomous vehicles. And he reminds us that we've been through big innovation like this before. Um, when, um, when affordable motor vehicles first became popularized, and in large part, the car went out in, in those uh, battles back then. And so ironically, uh, it's now time to put ourselves in the driver's seat of how our, com our communities are going to plan for self-driving cars. So the final area I wanted to, uh, Sorry. yeah, we got yeah. It. okay. So just let me just say the, the final area I want to touch on was um, the impact of, of, of the tech community itself on our, on our, um, on our communities. And um, you're seeing it here in Silicon Valley as well, you know, back in, in my home community of Seattle. Um, you know, great prosperity, but not evenly distributed, lots of impacts on housing and, and, and other issues. And I'm sure we will have lots of questions about that um, and have conversation about it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you both. So I'm hearing several themes that run through, even though these are at very different levels of conversation at one, in one sense. There are several themes that are running through both of them. Um, one of them has to do with regulation and the role of regulation. We live in a world in the Silicon Valley where even saying regulation seems to send chills up. Uh, if business will flee, the corporations are hysterical about it. But regulation, as you pointed out, is the backdrop of an awful lot of what gives us security in using the technology that exists. So one issue I want to raise is regula regulation. Another has to do with uh, privacy um, and where the boundaries of privacy are. And I think by bringing in local government into the larger discussion, because the focus of the privacy debate has really been around the kind of Facebook issues. And there are times when you want government to, in a sense, violate privacy of a perhaps a different kind. So privacy is another <coughs> domain I would like to spend some attention on. And then the third one is really democracy. So um, the kind of thing that um, Nate is really talking about is ways in which the internet can interfere with um, our voting systems and that level of democracy, but there's also the local level democracy and the local level governance and how you bring people into that process and how you use technology both for good and the problems that it can cause. So why don't we start with the regulatory issue, if that's all right. And whoever wants to jump in there, I will let them. Maybe you should, Nate, because um, Carrie raised a set of issues about regulation that I haven't heard you talk about before. Well, I've always been a little mystified by Silicon Valley's aversion and allergic reaction to regulation at all. And they sort of 
haven't read their political science textbooks on this a little bit. I agree. Which is because, you know, and, and they're paying the price for it because what they're ending up with is, is bad regulation, you know, and what they should be working with uh, government to do is have better regulation. Uh, and the problem is that the Europeans are, of course, the tail that's going to wag the dog here because they have decided, um, you know, that the, the American companies, right, who are now essentially affecting those democracies and the, those economies in a major way are, uh, you know, they, they've, the European governments have had enough of them, right? And, and, and I should say that the, the um, this is sort of the flip side of the sovereignty issue I was talking about before, right? These companies are seen as exporters of American values around the world, right? And I'm always fascinated when I talk to the leaders of these firms, the international context in which they operate. So if you say, for example, you know, here's how you should deal with fake news, right? They say, all right, well, here's how it's going to uh, play out in Myanmar. Here's how it's going to play out in Turkey, right? And they're thinking about all the, the countries at once. Um, but so the European approach to this right now, it's, it's taken, for example, by the German so-called fake news bill, which is not really about fake news, but is about uh, piercing intermediary liability. And by that, we mean holding Google, Facebook, and other platforms liable for speech that occurs on their platforms, right? Now, that has all kinds of... Um, uh, deleterious effects um, to, for speech on the platforms as well as the kind of um, uh, position you put these platforms in to overregulate and to use AI to do it. I can talk a little bit more uh, about that. Um, but it's a consequence of their um, egotism and, and inability to uh, think seriously about the responsibility uh, that they have for the effects that they're having on democracy. Now, um, there, it, I was impressed that a week or two ago when, when Zuckerberg uh, went before Congress, he, he declared, for example, uh, Facebook now supports something called the Honest Ads Act, which they hadn't up until that point. And that was about trying to have greater transparency in who's behind political advertising, right? Um, and Facebook actually is going to go farther, than, at least they've announced, they're going to go farther than the law requires in trying to provide information about, say, all kinds of uh, political ads uh, on their platform. But that's exactly what they should be doing. What, one of the things, though, that, that you realize, and this came out in, the, in those hearings where it was clear that the members of Congress had not opened a Facebook page, right? I mean, that they really had no idea what the platform was doing, you know, what was about, you know, to the point where the interchange between Senator Orrin Hatch and Mark Zuckerberg is like one for the record books, where, where he's like, well, so how do you make money if you don't produce anything? As off he had like, <laughs> as if he discovered something. It's like, ah, well, it's all, and, he, and, and Zuckerberg, who apparently thought it was like a trick question, he's like, well, we sell advertising. <laughs> oh, you know, um, and so the uh, but but the, the point is, is that through like the Honest Ads Act is actually flawed in many significant ways because they're trying to take a TV paradigm and apply it online. But if you work with if these tech firms worked with the um, uh, government regulators to craft what would be sensible regulations to deal with privacy, to deal with, um, um, you know, these democracy effects, so they'd be a lot better off. So what I'm hearing, though, is really interesting because here is Congress, which seems incompetent in terms of thinking about the companies it has to regulate versus a place like King County government, which is extremely competent in thinking. I mean, when we see when we think about some of the innovation in regulation, it's actually been coming from the urban space and trying to deal with an Uber or some of the other uh, sharing apps. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there's a big question about who gets to regulate, right? Is it the federal government level? Is it the local government level? Is it counties? Is it cities? Is it the states? Um, and, you know, there are, I think, these big issues around privacy, around anti-discrimination, where I really feel like we need the federal government to step up and provide a platform. It's not going to be... Um, it's it's not going to be effective to try to do that at the local level, but when you get into issues around you know the real shape of our the places in which we actually live every day, there's a lot of space there where you know uh, residents and the government and together need to kind of decide what we want our communities to look like and then how we want to regulate businesses as a as a result of that. Can I just say one other thing here, which is that one of the reasons they, these firms should be 
uh, gravitating toward better regulation is that otherwise they put get put in these terrible positions yeah. to decide um, what speech is valuable and not and and so that all of I mean a lot of this intermediary liability legislation uh, in Europe is saying all right you Facebook you've got to, you have to take down within 24 hours of notice illegal speech that occurs on your platform. Right. It's like, what if your firm, I mean, and I teach First Amendment law here at, at, at Stanford. I couldn't do I that, do you it. know? Yeah. And, and it, it's extremely challenging. It, it, so the, the point about government regulation, smartly done, is you force the government to make these really hard choices. And they are difficult decisions about what is hate speech, about what is obscenity, about what is um, defamation and the like. And if you, ha- but, but they, their allergy to, to government regulation has led them to fight against all that government regulation, um, uh, you know, no matter what the context is. So let's move into the democracy space, because that's also something you're both talking about, but at different levels. Um, so Carrie, let's start with you. And, and so when you're talking about creating a local government and a, set, a citizenry that's able to decide on its, how its world is going to look, what it, what is the, how do you talk about that in democratic terms? What does that mean? Well, that's... A really big question. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, you know, uh, in the Seattle region in particular, I think we're having a lot of, of struggle with that. Um, as inequities in our communities are getting wider, there seems, t- and it's sort of ec- echoing some of what um, Nate is saying about the polarization in conversation that's happening on the internet. Um, I don't really see the polarization in terms of the political kind of dialogue happening as much in the in the King County area, but there's definitely this polarization in our life experience um, that informs how we look at issues of access to uh, technology or the use of technology or the regulation of technology. And, um, you know, we're actively trying to work in King County government in bridging those divides bringing communities and grassroots leaders to the table with um, business communities and trying to find pathways through both to open up the prosperity that the tech community is bringing um, to more people from our local communities, but also to expand um, you know, the, the view and understanding both by the business community and by um, you know, regular people about what what the issues are and what the solutions can be. And I think if we can really foster those kind of cross-sector conversations, that's where we're going to um, find solutions that are going to be stronger and I think more long-lasting as well. Well, Let me press you on that a minute because uh, Seattle and King County is a place where we have some really major corporations, right? Yep. So um, I live in Amazonia, basically. (laughs) It's right there. Um, we've got... You know, that makes you Wonder Woman. Yeah, I know that. Um, I'm an Amazonian. Um, we have Starbucks. We have Costco. We have Microsoft, yep. the big bear in the room. How do you hold, which, and all of them are in King County, so how do you, you know, we're having trouble at the federal level holding these corporations accountable. How do you do that at the local level. I mean, they have to, they're part of that community. They're just deciding what that community looks like. Well, and I think it's one of the paradoxes of the Seattle region, actually, is that we do have these big, globally iconic businesses um, that are sort of homegrown right from, from our region. And, you know, I think heretofore, they've been very focused on growing their global business and not, you know, very, you know, not as focused as I think in other places on the local community. And that's starting to change. I think it's um, both as many of those businesses have matured, they start um, to think more about, um, the leaders start to think more about their own personal legacies. You mean as the founders past the age of 30? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Um, And, you know, really what they want to do in the local community. But it's also, I don't, I mean, it's kind of this mutual accountability, right? I mean, for those businesses to continue to survive in our region, they can't survive, they can't um, keep growing businesses based on importing talent from elsewhere. It's just, it's just not sustainable. So, 
we really have to figure out collectively how we're going to reorient both public and private, for example, workforce development systems um, to move towards giving more opportunity for people from the local community to access those jobs. Um, and, you know, I don't think that's a matter of regulation. I think it's a matter of people forming relationships and getting together and understanding the problem better and talking and developing solutions. And there's mutual accountability there. And how do you deal with the issue of accountability and thinking about it in terms of, I mean, you're dealing with Facebook right now and Google and all these companies. So you've been talking about the monopoly problem. Mm -hmm. But it, again, it's, it's a larger problem of accountability and a set of democratic institutions which may or not, may not be particularly effective at this point in dealing with that question. Well, so one of the, I think, common themes here is that you've got these global firms that are now dealing with you know, sovereign entities, whether at the local level or at the state or national level, and how do, how do they deal with that? Um, and we don't have a great model for, <laughs> for, for what they should be doing. I mean, there are always proposals, for example, that Facebook should have, like when it went public, it should have given like one share to each one of the Facebook users, so then you could have had sort of corporate democracy mm -hmm. uh, working through um, Facebook. Um, but, but they are... They didn't do that. They did not, yeah, yeah, no. I mean, they are effectively a monarchy, right? I mean, you know, yeah. that, 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 the king's and, and uh, uh, but, you know, they, one scandal with Cambridge Analytica cost them $50 billion in the space of three weeks, you know, and so there are checks uh, on, on them, and, and some of these checks are going to be, I mean, they're, they're going to be, account, like I said, it's going to be the Europeans, it's going to be um, a lot of these other countries that, that bring the force of government to bear on them, and we'll see, you know, uh, what the spillover effects are uh, in the U.S. I mean, I think that um, they, you know, when, when Kerry was talking, I, I, the the thing that occurred to me, right, was how local governments are bending over backwards for these firms, right? It's the exact opposite of this problem, so that you end up with, you know, uh, this, I mean, anyone saw that Saturday Night Live skit about, you know, all the cities trying to com compete for the next Amazon, Amazon yeah. headquarters, right? And it's like, it's just like with, with sports stadiums and the like, it's just, all right, what, how much of our future will we mortgage for this, um, uh, this firm to come in here? Uh, and so they, with the social media companies, I think it's actually a little bit different. As I said, they're seen as exporters of American culture, as well as our particular view of speech, right? And so there's a real fight that's going on between these governments and uh, these foreign firms. Um, uh, you know, the, the, if you look at the big internet, for the most part, you know, when you talk about regulating the internet, you're talking about regulating the corridor from Seattle down to Palo Alto, right? And, and uh, that's, you know, th there's, there's a real question, and Timothy Garton Nash at, at Oxford has a, has a book on this, um, or where he makes this argument, which is, is the future of the internet going to be determined by the United States, Europe, or China? Right, three very different models about what uh, how the internet will, will be structured. Uh, right now, we're sort of all competing in one way or another. With China has this sort of walled garden uh, idea. You've got uh, Europe, which is sort of piercing intermediary liability, and we are really extremists. Right, at the U.S. is out on a limb, not just with respect to government regulation, but our views of speech. Right, when I teach uh, First Amendment law, you know, talk about all those areas I just mentioned: defamation, obscenity, hate speech. Um, um, and the like, we are all the way, I mean, there's no other country in the world that's comparable to the United States in our libertarianism when it comes to speech. And so uh, these firms, for the most part, are homegrown in the way they think about uh, not just political expression, but expression generally. And there's a, you know, a fight against that all over the world. I think we should open, sorry, did you want to get I one just more wanna, thing in? I want to yeah. open it up to questions. just want to pick up on um, the competition among cities over Amazon's second headquarters, and it's actually kind of instructive because if you look at what Amazon is looking for, there it's many of the same things that we want as our own communities, right? A great transportation network, good education, um, p career pathways into that, that industry, and yet I think a lot of, you know, some of the responses that I think you're seeing from communities are very much kind of this old style of economic development incentives. And those aren't really the things that uh, firms need the most. So I think there are areas where we can, you know, work together better um, to try to address some of the big issues. Great. 
Okay, I'm ready to take questions. And what, what is going to happen with the questions is I will point to somebody and, and a microphone will come to you from one side of the room. So <laughs> um, please uh, use the microphone because we are taping this. And two, please introduce yourself. So I saw a question right there. And then the second question will be in the back. My name's Eric. Who promised me he would ask a question. I have a question for Karen. So you're talking about uh, uh, kind of the, the people left behind from technology, communities left behind. Uh, is there a really compelling, strong argument that you've been able to uh, concoct for companies so they don't feel backed into this? Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't think it's about providing people who don't have the necessary competencies, um, you know, to it's to take to have jobs in in the tech industry what we have to figure out is how we work better together to prepare people for those jobs um, and there's a lot of public investment and there's a lot of private investment in uh, training people up and um, we can probably I think be making those investments much more productive by working together so I don't know if that answers your question he'll be at dinner he can push it right later. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Wynne Derman. I graduated from the business school, and your talk has been very enlightening to me, and I decided uh, I would ask you a question. And the question has to do with how would I describe the United States? And I'd have to say in the last hundred years, I would say we're an accordion. We open up to business and uh, doing all the things they want to do until there's a catastrophe, like Standard Oil forming a monopoly, and then government comes in and cracks down on it. We open up to the banks doing all they could do in 2008 to ruin the economy and kill Wall Street. And then we come back and we try to fix it up after the fact. And we're doing the same thing now that we've been doing for 100 years. We're letting all these problems get out of hand, and then we're turning to government and asking them to fix it. And then 10 years later, we have pressure from the administration that turns around and says, we've got to undo Dodd-Frank. Have we not lost, have we lost the right knowledge that tells us that we're gonna go back and do this again with the same mistakes we had? Now, if my feeling is true, your image doesn't fit what I think we're gonna to have to do to make this better. I think that was to you, Nate. Okay, um, I, well, um, look, I don't think that the US government is actually going to regulate social media in any significant way. Um, what's interesting is you are getting a political push from both the right and the left, so that the right feel, and you could see this in the hearings, where um, the right is worried that the liberals in Silicon Valley are editing um, and censoring uh, conservative expression. The left is worried about the monopoly power of, of these firms and how it's, um, you know, how they're using that economic power for, for bad ends. Uh, and so there is this strange coalition which doesn't fit our normal way of thinking about the polarized politics of our time. Yet, if it's, <laughs> if there's going to be regulation, you're going to have to find some way for uh, the parties to, to come together on it right now. And it doesn't, I mean, the government can barely do anything, let alone regulate in this area where they don't understand it. Uh, and, and so uh, it, it's hard to, but that's why I think it's going to be coming from abroad and that there is what we call sort of the Brussels effect, right? That there's a, um, uh, uh, and we sort of like what we have here in the California effect in, in, in the United States, where like whether it's environmental regulations and the like, California can set a standard because we're so big that would affect uh, the country. And Brussels may be able to set uh, a rule that's going to affect the structure of the internet and how expression develops. That that accordion phenomenon you're describing is not, you're right, is, but, but, but that's the way government works, right? I mean, um, until there's pressure uh, and a significant you know, impetus for reform, you don't get it. Um, this area, but, but there are no easy answers. Of, of the types of questions that I mentioned, right, of these, these phenomena of uh, disinformation and hate speech and, and anonymity and the like, these are extremely fraught areas, right? If you start thinking about, for example, a White House Office of Information Integrity, right, that's not exactly something a lot of us would be running to, to support, right? If you, as much as you might be afraid of, of the fake news problem online, uh, government reactions to it are 
are, are pretty frightening. Uh, and so these are extremely difficult uh, problems. To some extent, based on the kind of uh, examples you put out there, um, you might think that antitrust law would be a, a, an answer in this area. Look, these, are, these firms are too big. Let's treat them as monopolies. But I, you know, I've talked to a lot of the, the folks who criticize these companies on, on antitrust grounds, and there are similarities with other monopolies. But fundamentally, the power of Google is its search engine, right? And the, and the power of, of Facebook is its news feed, right? And you, ca you cannot break those things up, right? It's not like, the, like AT&T or, or these other kinds of firms. You could regulate them, right? You can try to prevent them from combining, you know, buying Instagram and WhatsApp and like uh, that. Or you can prevent, uh, you know, Alphabet from gluing together, you know, everything from rockets to search engines. But it's, it's not, you know, if, if the problem from a democracy standpoint is the way that they curate information... It's not clear to me that there's an antitrust solution to that. Mm -hmm. This woman right here. Thank you. Um, my name is Angelique. I'm an educator at a local high school. So I was curious, like, how might we engage youth since they are digital natives? Like, not only in the democratic process, but also, as you mentioned, like, in the need for having regulation, um, and what might that look like? And I don't know if you have any examples um, today. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's a it, it's very great question. Um, so in um, the Seattle region, we have a huge flux, influx of younger people who are coming to work for these technology companies, um, and you know other other uh, kinds of companies as well. And what, you're, what we're finding from um, looking at some of the survey data is a lot of um, young people really want to be connected into um, the social fabric of their communities and working on um, social issues, and, and they don't know how. And in the Seattle region in particular, a lot of them feel like quite isolated, like they don't quite know how to fit into the community. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum where, you know, you're seeing a lot of people who have been longtime residents um, in the region also starting to feel like they're disconnected as well. So we're actually trying to, like, really think about that. Um, and I don't have an answer for you today, but I think it's a really important um, question uh, and how we, you know, tap into the energy of this uh, you know, kind of younger generation of people who bring new ideas, um, new kinds of solutions, and a new energy to the problems. I sort of see the Parkland shooting as like a test case for how whether the native uh, digital natives of, of young people are going to have the a, a unique political impact. Right, I think the jury is still out on that. Um, and, but that that if if ever there was an opportunity to sort of see whether uh, mobilization, democratic mobilization can occur uniquely among this group because of their digital savvy, then that's it. I mean, the way that they've sort of gone after Marco Rubio is sort of an interesting, for those who've seen it, is sort of an interesting uh, test case and, you know, never anger a 16-year-old. Uh, but, but, but they, you know... Uh, really not a group of them. Yeah, right. And, and, and so uh, uh, I still, you know, we have a project here as part of this project on democracy and the internet, um, Sam Weinberg in the education department is trying to develop curricula for high school students, um, digital literacy, and, and um, uh, particularly to help with uh, media literacy and thinking about how to distinguish between real and fake news. Um, but the truth is, you know, this is not a problem just for young people. This is a problem for uh, older folks as well. And we also have a problem at uh, a project at the center that Sarah Ogilvie, who's sitting there, is part of on the digitally native and how they're forming values and language and interactions and what that means for a whole variety. So it's a research project, um, which then will hopefully inform some of the kinds of policies and activities that need to be done. Um, Thomas, I'm going to wait on you because you'll be at dinner. So this woman right here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Michelle Littlefield from the city of Redwood City. I lead the analytics efforts there uh, next door. So I've heard uh, a couple of things tonight. One is that Facebook and other companies are being described as a new monarchy. Um, and I also heard the term or phrase computational propaganda. 
from both the federal and local levels, do you see an emergence of a new form of government? Do you have any insights on that? And, and how should we, as government employees, respond to that? Well, so, um, the, I mean, look, they're corporations. Right? <laughs> you know, it's sort of, it, it, you know, the, there's a question is, is it, the, the normal checks on multinational corporations still do work here? I mean, so whether it's an oil company or whether it's Facebook, right, there, there are some characteristics that are similar to these firms that have, uh, in, or, or the, you know, the Dutch East India Company. There, there's all kinds of um, uh, precedents for regulating them in, in particular ways. What makes this different is the control over the information, right, so that the way that they curate information uh, is particularly pronounced. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, in a sense, they are... Um, government-like, right? They talk about controlling the public square, right? They're the, the, and they have, they have projects on that. Um, and so I think the way I look at it is that, that we need to think about their uh, control of the communication environment and the ecosystem in some ways the way that we've thought about governments, right? Because as they get that much power and that uh, uh, big reach, we need to start thinking, well, what are the rules that they should follow? Let me say that I think they think about it this way. Now, there is a caricature of these platforms that all of the decisions that they're making in this space that I've described as being motivated by money, I don't think that's right. I mean, I think that they, um, th that a lot of it is motivated by these libertarian First Amendment kind of values that they've learned since you know, uh, growing up in the United States, most of them. And, and I, I think that they have a typical kind of Silicon Valley utopianism that characterizes all kinds of other um, uh, things that go on around here. Uh, but, but so I think that they are sort of thinking of themselves, if not as governments, at least as uh, communities, right, that have certain rules uh, that transcend governmental and national borders. Um, and so they're, they're sort of muddling their way through as to what the right way uh, to to do this is and you you see this in the way that they've uh, particularly Facebook has has responded to the Russian uh, abuse of their platform right they now admit you know that there's been that this was a problem um, but that was not what Facebook was originally thought about when Mark Zuckerberg was in his Harvard dorm room right he wasn't thinking about Russian influence on on American elections right I mean you know this you, you've seen the movie yeah. uh, you know uh, uh, it, <laughs> that's not what it was about and so but it's you know. It, it, it's, it's moved in that direction. Now they realize that they have uh, responsibility here, there, but realize that they are going to get criticized no matter what they do, right? They, if they're either going to regulate too much, and that will have a viewpoint discriminatory effect. Some points of view will be sort of submerged or taken off the platform. Some of them, you might like those, those viewpoints here uh, for a time, but in other countries, you might not. Um, or they're going to regulate not enough, and so then you have the anarchy, which is, uh, you know, produces the bot problem, fake news, and the like. Yeah, I, I mean, there are kind of new governance models that are either emerging or will need to emerge simply because, um, you know, in many respects, our federal government is not working so great right now. So we're seeing a lot of more of the innovation around some of these issues coming from larger regional governments. And, um, I, you know, in a lot of ways, I think there's some great opportunities there to work in different ways, work across sectors um, on new kinds of models. And in a lot of ways, I think, you know, that's really problematic. We need the federal government to provide some kind of, you know, foundation for addressing some of these issues at a national level or even an international level. Um, and, you know, we're also, um, it, it, it concerns me that we're, we're moving to this environment where you have, you know, fairly well-off metro areas being capable of tackling some of these issues and other areas of the country not. I mean, what's a tiny little city government um, going to do, uh, you know, with respect to some of these very, very complex issues when you have a you know, a, a citizen legislature, a resident legislature, where people are working full time and they're trying to do their city council job at night. It's it's pretty complex. I can't help but now recognize Thomas, who, as president of Estonia, 
actually did a tremendous amount in figuring out new governance structures around use of the internet. I'm Thomas Elvis at the Hoover Institute. And, um, I just wanted to say that one thing that has not been discussed, here, especially when you're talking, Nate, about okay, the, the European approach and, um, and free speech. Actually, I think that's a minor issue in Europe. I think it's a much bigger issue, uh, especially if you read the New York Times piece last Sunday. I mean, communal violence in yeah. Sri Lanka, Myanmar, India that is fomented through Facebook. Uh, the, it's an issue there. In Europe, the real issue is data protection and and the the massive use of data. And this is something that hasn't been discussed here at all. Uh, and I was wondering, I mean, that's where the regulation is going to hit them, and it's their economic model. So I was wondering what you think of what is what will happen with uh, with your with people's data, and and that's also I think where the public reaction is going to be biggest, not against fake news, but uh, because everyone has their favorite fake news, yeah. but in with uh, your private personal data. Yeah, and Europe's leading the way on this. And, you know, it's interesting. So there's a piece, I think, in the Times today, or was it yesterday, on how the privacy protections actually preserve the status of incumbents of these big firms because they will be able to survive this. It's not clear that a startup company will be able to uh, thrive under under these new privacy regulations. I'll say one other thing for this effort that I'm leading with Gary King to try to study the impact of Facebook on democracy or social media generally. It's not clear we can do the kind of studies in Europe that we want to because you mm. cannot get you, you, the, the privacy law will prevent us from analyzing pretty much any individual level data to figure out whether, you know, communications, the kind of media consumption that people uh, uh, experience has effects on, you know, their behavior on the platform or what they do. And so it does, it has this sort of strange chilling effect on trying to figure out the answers to some of the problems that um, uh, people think are most pressing. I think both of the, you know, the fake news and, and hate speech and the like are, are problems. And, and then you've, uh, the data privacy uh, issue is, is, one that they're taking very seriously. And these are ones that I think you could see. Um, there might be some room for U.S. regulation here as well. But I do think that Europe is 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 leading the way on this and has been for some time. Um, I, again, you know, the Cambridge Analytica scandal has now become the frame through which we view this, this selling of data or the um, way that Facebook uh, looks at your data. Cambridge Analytica, I now think, is just kind of a metaphor for the larger problem. I mean, the Cambridge Analytica breach is, I think, more complicated than people understand. Um, and probably in the scheme of things, of all the other privacy violations you experience <laughs> from being on these kinds of platforms, uh, I, I don't think it was as big a deal as people are, are giving it. But again, it's a metaphor through which we, we see this problem. And you're right that it does cut right to the business model. So if you start thinking about um, what would affect the bottom line of these companies, I think you're right, that um, uh, if they are unable to harvest data and then allow for ad targeting uh, based on that. But in some, like I said, in some ways it's, it's too late, right? Because the, you are still, no matter what happens with the, the, these firms, they are still have this position of uh, getting so many eyeballs, right? So you're gonna. They, so while the ad targeting might not be as micro-targeted as it would be if they were uh, harvesting a lot of of this data and selling it, um, uh, they're still going to be in the position of uh, you know being the dominant communication environment. Yeah. We have time for one last question. I think this young man back here. Hello, uh, I'm Daniel, and I'm a high school senior at, from Monte Vista High School. And I had a question regarding hate speech. And I'd like to echo the sentiments of Senator Ted Cruz during his congressional hearing questions of how certain hate speech or certain conservative news or speech was actually labeled as hate speech by Facebook or Twitter or even on Reddit. And so I've noticed that you uh, stated that hate speech has been increasing. But I'd like to question if that increase in hate speech has just been the regulation of conservative news or the like being removed or censored, and does this uh, somehow concern the marketplace, marketplace of nonpartisan ideas, or, and like, does it put it into jeopardy? So I, I said, I hope I was clear, that I, it's not clear that hate speech has actually been rising, and there's an interesting study by the NYU Social Media and Public uh, 
uh, political participation lab on just this question. And so how do you define hate speech, right? And how do you make it so it's not um, uh, coterminous with, with a certain political ideology? They use a really interesting method to measure hate speech. What they did is they went into subreddits which are like avowedly neo-Nazi. Trust, all of us would agree that this is racist stuff, right? Uh, they did this with uh, misogynist groups. They did this with anti-Semitic, uh, white nationalists and the like. And they then used machine learning to figure out how racists talk, okay? They then took that, uh, th th that uh, algorithm, that, that uh, AI, and then applied it to Twitter. Right? And so it's not enough to just look at racial epithets, most of which are banned on Twitter anyway, but you, you, you got to figure out sort of what is the, uh, the way that racists, based on these avowedly racist subreddits, how they talk. And then they find, so look, not a monotonic increase in hate speech over time, um, but episodic, right? Around Charlottesville, you're going to see this. Actually, after the 2016 election, a spike in misogynist uh, uh, speech and the like. Um, but there's no question that there are cauldrons of the internet, right, that are, are just themselves proudly dedicated toward racist, homophobic, uh, 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 extremist, neo-Nazi speech and the like. Um, there is a risk, you're right, that, you know, especially in this day and age, um, that, you know, there's going to be a disparate impact, disparate political impact if you start regulating uh, hate speech, right? But, um, you know, we, we, can, we can debate whether... You know, if what the president says about uh, Mexico, whether that's hate speech or not, or whether um, what people are, you know, whether the Charlottesville protests, whether that is uh, hate speech or not. But, you know, if you're going to regulate that, those kinds of um, those kinds of terms and those kinds of that kind of speech, it's going to have a disparate impact on a particular uh, ideological uh, group. Um, the problem here, and maybe this is also where you're gesturing, is that once the, it, it becomes difficult, right, to just have humans to be the moderators for what is hate speech, because you've got all, you know, you're talking about all kinds of speech on this platform. And so do the algorithms, does the AI go too far, right? And, you know, that's an empirical question. Um, and uh, these are, you know, super sensitive uh, areas that, you know, we haven't, you know, in the US, for the most part, you really, the government really has a hard time regulating hate speech. You can regulate what are called fighting words, like words that will lead to, you know, you punching me. Um, but, but when it comes to racist speech, it's actually quite difficult under the First Amendment uh, to regulate it. But these platforms, in this respect, are not governments. So if they want to, you know, they, if they want to be viewpoint discriminatory, if they want to regulate hate speech in an expansive way, they have the right to do so. Well, I want to thank both of our fabulous speakers and thank all of you.